Hi, my name is Ben Clay. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Cambridge, and welcome to this video on the top 10 blood smears that you have to know. The peripheral blood smear is a really useful test for investigating lots of different hematological conditions, and it gives us a good idea of how the red blood cells, the platelets, and the white blood cells all look. And there are 10 particular blood smears that you have to know the appearances of that are the most essential ones. Without further ado, let's go into it. The first blood smear that we have to know is the microcytic anemia. When we look at this blood smear, it can look pretty normal, and it actually can be very difficult to say that's microcytic anemia just looking at the blood film. But alongside this blood film, we'll have done a full blood count, and part of that will have told us the MCV, that is the mean cell volume. So normally, red blood cells have a normal size that they are, and in microcytic anemia, that means that the red blood cells are smaller than normal. And there are three main causes for a microcytic anemia. The first of which is iron deficiency, which is by far the most common. The second is thalassemia, which is a genetic condition where we've got a defect in haemoglobin itself. And the third of which is the anemia of chronic disease, which is often kidney disease. So going back to this first one of iron deficiency, which is by far our most common cause for microcytic anemia, on the blood smear, it can also present with two additional things. The first of which is called anisocytosis, which is a variation in the sizes of the red blood cells. And if we look at this example again, we can see an element of anisocytosis here where instead of all the blood cells being a very uniform size, we see some that are significantly smaller and some that are larger. And the other thing that we can see is poikilocytosis, which is a difference in the shapes, the morphologies of the cells. Again, this one doesn't look so bad actually in terms of poikilocytosis, but we can see that some of them look more elongated than others. And in severe iron deficiency anemia, we can even get pencil cells, whereas instead of this sort of round or oval shape, we get very elongated stick-like red blood cells, which are a very key marker of iron deficiency anemia. So let's think about the four main causes of iron deficiency anemia. The first of which is that we've got a reduction in the amount of iron that we're taking in. So in some diets, such as veganism and vegetarianism, we just don't have enough iron in the diet, and so our body can't absorb enough because we just aren't taking enough in, and that can cause iron deficiency and a microcytic anemia. The other way is that we can have bleeding, whereas instead of not taking in enough, we're losing iron from bleeding. And this is very, very common in women who are menstruating because they're just losing a significant amount of blood in some cases on a monthly basis. But in other cases, such as in older men, we get very worried about seeing uh, a microcytic iron deficiency anemia as there's bleeding from somewhere. And in most cases, we're worried about a GI cancer, that is either an esophageal cancer, a gastric cancer, a colorectal cancer. The third case of iron deficiency anemia is malabsorption. It goes alongside diet in some way, where we might be taking in enough in the foods that we're eating, but our body can't absorb it. And this can be due to short gut syndrome, where we've had a reduction in the amount of functional gut area, and that can be due to things like celiac disease, where significant inflammation in the gut can reduce its ability to take up iron, or due to things like Crohn's disease, where we might have had an amount of gut physically removed through surgery. And then the fourth thing to think about for iron deficiency anemia is pregnancy, where this can be quite a very common finding and lots of women who are pregnant need to take iron just to keep on top of this. Next, what do we do about microcytic anemia? It depends on the cause. So for iron deficiency anemia, the first line treatment is going to be iron supplementation. So if these patients just aren't taking in enough iron or they've got some level of mild malabsorption, then we can treat that just by putting in more iron and help, helping the body to take up more of it. But if they've got some significant problem like bleeding, so if you're worried they might have a gut cancer or something, obviously just putting more iron in is not going to solve the underlying problem. So treat any underlying problem if you can. Again, they might have celiac disease, and we want to get on top of that by removing gluten from the diet. But assuming it's just a plain, standard, quite benign iron deficiency anemia, we can give more iron, or if it's really severe or not working with just giving more iron, we can do a blood transfusion. Secondly, thinking about thalassemia, it's a genetic condition where we've got a genetic defect in haemoglobin. We can't cure the physical defect in haemoglobin, but we can give them transfusions to top up the amount of red blood cells they have. Thirdly, for chronic disease, again, I said the most common way that we get this anemia of chronic disease is through chronic, chronic kidney disease. And the first way we treat that is by giving more iron again. But secondly, the main way that we get anemia of chronic disease due to kidney disease is because the kidneys are important production important producer of EPO, which is erythropoietin, which stimulates our bone marrow to produce red blood cells. When the kidneys aren't working properly, all of the kidneys functions are reduced, including the production of EPO. Therefore, we can give supplementary EPO 
to stimulate that bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. The second essential blood smear that we want to be able to identify is a macrocytic anemia. This is different to a microcytic anemia, which we just discussed. So in this case, it's an anemia again. So we've got a low number of red blood cells and a low level of hemoglobin. But the macrocytic part describes the fact that the mean cell volume, that is the size of the red blood cells, is larger than normal. And when we look at this blood film, we can see that because those two big purple cells in the center are lymphocytes. And normally the red blood cells are significantly smaller than a lymphocyte. But in this case, we can see that many of them are the same size or even slightly larger than those lymphocytes. So we have a macrocytic anemia. There are two main causes of a macrocytic anemia. The first of which is vitamin B12 deficiency and the second is folate deficiency. Both of these can be caused by insufficient B12 or folate in the diet. These are particularly seen in extreme diets like veganism or ketogenic diets. Then for vitamin B12, a key cause is pernicious anemia, and this is where you get a lack of intrinsic factor, which is a cofactor produced by the parietal cells in the stomach, which allow B12 to be taken up further down the line in the gut. The third cause, short bowel syndrome. This is where we've got a reduced functional gut area, reducing the amount of surface area for absorbing B12 from the gut. Cases of short bowel syndrome can be due to conditions like Crohn's disease, where you've had amount of gut removed. The fourth cause, celiac disease. In this case, celiac disease often affects the terminal ileum, which is the end part of the last part of the small intestine, which is a key place for B12 and folate absorption. And that significant inflammation in celiac disease can make it very difficult for the body to absorb enough B12 or folate. And the fifth cause of B12 deficiency is metformin, a very, very common drug used to treat type 2 diabetes. And a well-known side effect of metformin is that it can lead to B12 deficiency. Then think about folate deficiency. Again, diet due to insufficient folate in the diet. Alcohol abuse can also cause folate deficiency. Short bowel syndrome, as we talked about, with causes including Crohn's and also celiac disease. Now, what are we going to do about macrocytic anemia? So, first of all, we want to address the underlying cause. So, if, for example, the patient has pernicious anemia, then what we can do is think about giving supplementary intrinsic factor, or we can uh, treat the celiac disease by cutting out gluten in the diet we can maybe change diabetes drugs if metformin is causing it. And then if that's not working or alongside that, we can give supplementary B12 and supplementary folate. The third essential blood smear that we want to be able to identify is spherocytosis. Now, when we look at this blood smear, you can see that it might appear quite normal. But when we look more closely at these red blood cells, we see that there are some normal ones with that sort of pale center, which is a normal biconcave disc shape but then some of them look completely homogenous across the surface, just a flat purple disc. And in those cases, those are spherocytes, whereas instead of having that normal biconcave disc shape, the cells are completely spherical, and this is abnormal. The most common cause of spherocytosis is hereditary spherocytosis, which is a genetic condition where the majority or all of the red blood cells are spherocytes. Other causes include the autoimmune hemolytic anemias, Let's break that down. So anemia, we've got a reduced number of red blood cells and hemoglobin. Hemolytic, that means red blood cells are being cut in half, they're being broken down. And autoimmune means the body's immune system is working against itself. And there are six main causes of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The first of which is idiopathic. That means we don't really know what causes it. It just happens, unfortunately. And the other five are well-known autoimmune conditions, which can have this as a part of their presentation. The first of those is SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. Then you've got rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis, also known as scleroderma, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. All of those autoimmune conditions can cause spherocytosis. Then what do we do about it? Hereditary spherocytosis, the key treatment is the removal of the spleen. And then secondary to that, because the spleen has an important immune function, we need to give these patients regular immunizations. Then, when we're thinking about the autoimmune hemolytic anemias, you want to address the underlying cause. So if the patient has SLE, for example, we can give them immunosuppressants to try and knock down that inflammation. And then the other key thing that we can do is give steroids in all of these patients. The fourth blood smear that we want to be able to identify are sickle cells. When we look at this blood smear, we see lots of normal red blood cells, which are circular in shape with a pale center. But then interspersed throughout them, we see these abnormal sickle cells. They almost look like fragments, 
and the sort of crescent shaped, C shaped or sickle shaped. And the sickle is an old piece of farming equipment which has that sort of hook shape which we see. And these are caused by sickle cell disease. This is a genetic disease. It's autosomal recessive. So that means you need to inherit two faulty copies of this allele in hemoglobin, which is the sickle cell hemoglobin type in order to be really affected. People who are heterozygous for it, that is have one faulty allele and one normal allele are mainly unaffected. So the severity varies by genotype, as I said. Most people in the world have two normal copies of hemoglobin and they don't have any sickle cells. People who are heterozygous have one faulty copy and are usually pretty unaffected. People who have two faulty copies are affected by sickle cell disease. Although when you look at them normally, they might be completely happy and fine, but when they get hypoxic, say they've got a lung condition or a cough or a cold, or it can just happen, unfortunately, just because, the hemoglobin in their red blood cells changes shape, the protein changes shape, and that causes a change in the shape of the red blood cell from its normal circular biconcave disc shape to this sickle shape. And these sickle cells get caught, get trapped, and they can cause painful sickling crisis where this sickle cells all build up in joints, in the spleen, and in the lungs. What do we do about it? So the first thing is we want to prevent these sickling crises, and the way that we do that is by giving hydroxyurea, which is a drug which increases the amount of fetal hemoglobin, which is a hemoglobin type that we all made in the womb, which has a different morphology to normal adult hemoglobin, but these patients have dysfunctional adult hemoglobin, so by increasing the amount of fetal hemoglobin, we're increasing the amount of normal hemoglobin in their cells and making it less likely that hypoxia will trigger this sickling. And then secondly, when these patients do get crises, the way that we manage that is with good analgesia, good painkillers, normally opioids are required because it's very painful. Secondly, oxygen, because sometimes these patients can get sickling crises in the lungs and cause significant hypoxia. And thirdly, through transfusions, if this sickle cell has led to a significant amount of anemia. The fifth blood smear presentation we want to know about are helmet cells. Well, let's look at this blood smear. We see lots of normal red blood cells, and we also see some abnormal red blood cells, which look like they've been chopped in half. And these look like a helmet that you could put on. And the reason we get this is due to the shearing of red blood cells mechanically by something in small blood vessels. So let's think about what that could be called. So basically, the Latin way that we would say that is microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. Let's break that down. Microangiopathic, you've got small vessels which are causing the problem, microangiopathic. Hemolytic, the blood cells are being chopped in half, they're being broken down. And anemia, we're getting a reduced number of blood, red blood cells and a reduced amount of hemoglobin in the blood. There are five main causes for this microangiopathic hemolytic anemias, which lead to these helmet cells. The first of which is disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, which is a very severe dysregulation of the coagulation cascade. And I encourage you to go and watch my video on the coagulation cascade to learn a bit more about that. The second of this is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. The third is hemolytic uremic syndrome. Fourth is HELP syndrome, which is a complication of pregnancy. And the fifth is where we have mechanical heart valves, where the metal in the mechanical heart valves literally shears these blood cells in half. Now, what do we do about these causes? For DIC, we want to treat the underlying cause, and then we can also give fresh frozen plasma and platelets in these cases. For TTP, we want to be doing plasmapheresis, that is plasma exchange, to get rid of whatever cofactors are causing this TTP, this problem. For HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, this is a complication of infection, and it's normally self-limiting, so we want to give supportive care only. We don't need to do anything interventional really here. For HELP syndrome, as I said, it's a complication of late pregnancy, and the most effective treatment for this is prompt delivery of the baby. And then for mechanical heart valves, we're thinking about conservative treatment, because this heart valve is in there, it's not going anywhere, it's been put in for a very good reason. And unless this patient is really significantly anemic, we can top that up with iron or with transfusions even if necessary, but mainly this is just a, a normal finding that we would see in these patients. The next blood smear we want to talk about are target cells. When we look at this blood smear, on first glance you might think that it looks quite normal, and we can see some normal red blood cells which are circular with that pale center, but in the middle of the screen we can see these abnormal cells, which alongside that pale center have a second dark spot in the center, such that they now look like a target, like an archer's target. And this is abnormal, and it has five main causes which can be remembered by the mnemonic HALTS, H-A-L-T-S. 
The first of these is hemoglobin C disease, which is a genetic disease similar to sickle cell in that it's a genetic condition which affects hemoglobin. The second is asplenia, so when we've removed the spleen or the spleen just isn't working because these abnormal old cells are normally removed by the spleen, but where the spleen isn't working, they're not, so they hang around in the blood and form these target cells. The third is significant liver disease. Then we've got thalassemia, which is another hemoglobin genetic condition. And the last is sickle cell disease, as we've previously talked about. And these can also occur in sickle cell disease due to a dysfunction of the spleen. What do we do about it? So for hemoglobin C disease, again, it's a genetic condition. We can't cure that. But what we want to do is give folate, which often helps in these patients. For asplenia, if this patient literally doesn't have a spleen or if it's just not working properly, the spleen has a very important immune function. So we often want to give them prophylactic, that is preventative antibiotics, because they can quite often be vulnerable to bacteria like Haemophilus influenzae. And the second thing we want to do is give them regular immunizations against pneumococcus, that's streptococcus pneumoniae, and H. influenzae again. For patients with significant liver disease, we want to be just treating the underlying liver disease. There's no more specific management for those patients. And then thalassemia and sickle cell disease, we've talked about previously. Thalassemia, we give transfusions, and sickle cell, sickle cell disease, we give hydroxyurea to increase the amount of fetal haemoglobin that's used and manage any crises as and when they occur. Next, we want to think about basophilic stippling. When we look at this blood smear, we can see several examples of basophilic stippling. There's one just above center in the screen, where we see it looks like a normal red blood cell in terms of size and morphology, but we see these plentiful purple dots throughout the red blood cell. And those are basophilic stipplings. And what they're caused by are little RNA deposits which are in the red blood cells, and basophilic describes the fact that they're purple in color, as basophils, which are a different white blood cell, appear very purple in color as well. The main cause we want to think about here is heavy metal poisoning. So those are normally lead, arsenic, silver and mercury. Obviously there are occupational causes for lots of these, there are also sinister causes so people can be poisoned with arsenic deliberately and then there's accidental in intake of these heavy metals uh, and you want to think about what the possible cause for that could be. A very important cause which you might think about in children for example is uh, if a child has been neglected they can get uh, pica which is this condition where children seek to eat anything basically to try and get their nutrition in and it's been seen before that the children can even eat paint off the walls and paint can contain lead it can contain silver it can contain lots of these heavy metals and it can cause heavy metal poisoning there are lots of additional very niche causes of basophilic stippling but in our exams and clinical practice the main one we'll be thinking about is heavy metal poisoning when we've got heavy metal poisoning the main thing we want to do is try and remove those heavy metals from the body and remove their effect and the main way that we do that is with chelation, which we give a drug called calcium EDTA, which goes into the blood and it sequesters all of those heavy metals from the blood and it allows the body to then remove them much more easily through the kidney. The last three blood smears that we're gonna talk about today are all related to different cancers, so very important to be able to identify. The first of these are lymphoblasts. When we look at this blood smear, we see lots of normal red blood cells, but we also see lots of lymphocytes. Normally we would not expect to see that it looks like we've got about 10 or so more lymphocytes in this blood film. Normally they'd be much less frequent. So firstly, we're thinking there seem to be quite a lot of lymphocyte type cells. So there's a lymphocytosis that we can see here, which is a concerning sign. And the second thing is when we look at these blood cells, they don't look particularly normal for lymphocytes. In these, it looks like it's almost entirely nucleus. We can see basically no cytoplasm whatsoever. The nucleus is that really intense purple pink color and the cytoplasm is normally a, a lighter color sort of orangish or even blue depending on the staining whereas in these cells all we can see is the, is the nucleus and the key thing in this is that the clinical context is very important if we're getting this blood smear from an eight year old person what we'll be thinking about is very different from we're thinking about this blood smear has come from a four-year-old child and the key thing that we want to think about when we see lymphoblasts is acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that is ALL, and that is the most common childhood cancer. And it's so important that I'm just gonna give a little bit of background about what we can see in terms of the symptoms. So generalized symptoms, weight loss, splenomegaly, that is an increase in the size of the spleen, which is not normally palpable, but you can feel a mass on the patient's left side of their abdomen. And fever, 
And then the key thing that we see in all acute leukemias, like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, is bone marrow failure, where the marrow just stops working altogether, and we get pancytopenia. That is a reduction in all of the types of blood cells that are produced by the bone marrow. So we get anemia because there are reduced red blood cells being made. So that presents with pallor, so paleness. You can see it under the eyelids, in the fingers, and in lighter skin patients on their skin. Fatigue, just because they're anemic, they get short of breath, they get tired. Um, and then the second cell that decreases are platelets. So we get thrombocytopenia, and that causes an increase in bruising and bleeding. Again, to learn more about coagulation and clotting and platelets, go and watch my video about coagulation. And the third thing is we lose the amount of normal white blood cells that are made, so we get leukopenia. So these patients are very vulnerable to infection. What do we do about it? Luckily, it has an extremely high cure rate in countries with good, good oncology services, um, and it's always treated with chemotherapy, and has upwards of a 95% five-year survival rate, which is great. Next, we'll think about smudge cells. These are due to a very different type of leukemia. Instead of acute lymphocytic leukemia, we're now thinking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. And this is normally seen in much older adults, so not seen in children, it's seen in people 50 plus. It's usually asymptomatic and it progresses normally very, very slowly. And so in most cases, we don't actually do treatment, we just watch and wait. And what are we looking at on the blood smear? We're seeing these smudge cells. What do I mean by that? So we've got normal red blood cells, as we can see, We've got some normal-ish looking lymphocytes, though again, I would say this looks like an awful lot of lymphocytes to be seeing on one small section of the blood film. So again, we're thinking there's lymphocytosis. So all these lymphocytes are being churned out from somewhere, which is normally not a good sign. But the key thing that we see here is that some of these cells look like they've been broken apart. If you look on the left-hand side of the screen at the bottom, there's one normal-ish looking lymphocyte, and then to the right of it, there's one which just looks like a big smudge all over the screen. And what that actually is, is literally a smudge of the cell. Because these lymphocytes in CLL get so big and they become so fragile, during the physical process of doing the blood smear, they get broken apart, and so they show up on a blood smear as these smudge cells. So as I said, usually asymptomatic, usually older adults. The key thing to worry about with CLL is something called the Richter transformation, where a pretty benign, really, cancer in CLL can become very dangerous and very concerning it can just randomly convert to a high-grade aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma which is something to watch out for. Management as we said normally watchful waiting, disease control if it's getting worse and causing symptoms we can do some chemotherapy to try and knock down the, the amount of disease activity but then if it undergoes that Richter transformation we'll be thinking about much more intensive treatment. The tenth and final blood smear that we need to know about in this top 10 blood smears that you have to know is the Rouleau formation. When we look at this blood smear, we see some normal red blood cells and then these long vertical stacks of red blood cells, and that's called a rouleau, which is French for stack. And we get this whenever there's a really increased amount of protein in the plasma. The main thing we worry about with the rouleau formation is multiple myeloma, which is a form of blood cancer, where we get an increase in the amount of protein called Bench Jones protein in the plasma, which causes this sticking together, this stacking of the red blood cells. Another cause, if you're not more worried about multiple myeloma, which will have other signs like bone pain and an increased calcium level is sepsis where increased protein in the blood due to the infection can cause this rouleau formation. Then what are we doing about this? Multiple myeloma, it's a very horrible cancer, has a generally quite poor prognosis especially compared to those leukemias that we've previously talked about. It's normally very intensive combination therapy with biological therapies, that's monoclonal antibodies, significant immunosuppression and steroids alongside. But then if we've got sepsis, We've got our key sepsis six that we want to do very quickly within an hour, which are taking blood cultures, monitoring the patient's urine output with a catheter, giving them IV fluids, giving them broad spectrum antibiotics, measuring their lactate level as a key prognostic factor, and also giving oxygen. Thank you for watching this video. Before you go, I want to highlight two more resources which are really useful for all medical students. The first of these is my physical examinations for OSCE ebook. This is the combination of all of my experience of six years of medical school in Cambridge, and it provides clear and concise examination checklists for all of the most common examinations you'll encounter in OSCEs and also in clinical practice. You can access this book by scanning the QR code or going to claimmedicalconsulting.com. It's available for a half price compared to the paper copy at £9.99, and you can pay in any currency at checkout. 
The second of these resources is the AI powered question banks by medibuddy.co.uk. These AI question banks are specifically designed for the UK MLA and PLAB exams. The PLAB exam is the international exam that all international medical graduates hoping to practice in the UK will take. And the UK MLA is the standardised UK medical final that all UK medical students will take from 2025 onwards. The PLAB will become the UK MLA from 2024 onwards. And Medibuddy are the only online provider who have specifically written 4,000 questions which target the MLA contact map specifically so that you cover everything you need to and don't waste time covering anything unnecessary. I've negotiated a 10% discount for everyone who uses the code BC10 on those UK MLA and PLAB question banks. Thank you. Thank you again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, comment and subscribe to see more from me. Thank you.